Okay, it's time to get to our teaching. I'm excited to commence a new teaching series with you. Would you turn with me in your Bible to Genesis chapter 28? Genesis chapter 28. We commence today a spring teaching series entitled Heaven with an initial message entitled Heaven and Earth. Let's pray and then we'll dive in. Abba, beloved Father, we call on you through the name of your wonderful Son, Jesus. Holy Spirit, come. Abide in us, with us, and lead us into all truth. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the Word of God made flesh in Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who makes the word of God come alive to each of us. And we ask that you would breathe afresh upon it, that you could write it on our hearts. Lord, you've invited us to follow you. We want to be disciples of yours, Jesus. And even in the subject matter of heaven, we wanna understand what your word is saying about it. Would you form our thinking, but all the more, Lord, would you shape our hearts to receive more of you? Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Several months ago, my son asked me a question that none of my children have ever asked me. Eli asked me, hey, Dad, would you be willing to teach on heaven before I go to college? So our son is graduating in June, and we will be taking him, it appears, to Biola in Southern California come August. Be prepared for me to be a mess in late August and September. Like we, okay, I can't even go there. And this is what he said to me. He said, Dad, you know, I, I think I know what our culture would say about heaven. But I think I've also come to realize that I have no idea what the Bible says about heaven. I really don't know what it says other than heaven. There's heaven. So, Dad, would you teach on it? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah. The will of God sounds a lot like your child asking for a teaching. And let me put it this way. If my children ever ask for a subject to be taught, I will teach it. That's all that has to happen. So yes, of course, son, of course. So I am leveraging the hope that a teaching that is fashioned for the benefit of my son is actually going to be a teaching that benefits us all. I did a series on heaven well over a decade ago. Still to this day, it's one of my favorite series. I thought I would largely regurgitate it. Uh-uh. <laughs> it was good, but this one is going to be different. It's going to be unique. And we find it an appropriate follow-up for the series that we just completed on the Gospel of Luke in which we were hearing the message of the upside down kingdom of Jesus. Do you realize that in the Gospel of Matthew that the kingdom of God is referenced consistently as the kingdom of heaven? God and heaven used interchangeably within the framework of kingdom? What's going on here? And it points in a direction that we really want to head. Consider with me some of the pop cultural caricatures about heaven. I mean, this is easy for us. It's a non-material place of clouds above us with a gate and Peter's there. There's small babyish looking chubby cherubs with harps. It's abstract. Where does this imagery come from? Well, the truth is, is it comes from all different sorts of sources. And it leaves us with this hodgepodge, this imagery, these caricatures that are confusing. What's clear is that at some point in the human story, people began to think, oh, oh, well, there's something up there. There's something like beyond there, as in the sky. You know, it there, yeah. And we now have a lot more information about, about there, don't we? 
about what's above us, what's beyond. I mean, we've now moved through it in airplanes and shuttles, but the caricatures remain, especially this notion that to go to heaven is to go up. Is this in any way accurate to the biblical understanding of heaven? Well, that's a good question, thank you for asking. Alongside it, let's also acknowledge the primary questions we tend to have about heaven. What's after all this? Where are my loved ones who have died? What's the point of it all? Okay, heaven, what's the point? And how can I know that I'm going there when I die? I mean, these are some of the most basic questions we ask around heaven. In light of these, we must also then consider this question. Are the authors of the Bible asking the same questions? Because if they're not, they're probably not going to be providing the answers that we tend to think of. Put a different way, what does the Bible actually highlight and focus on when it comes to the subject of heaven? In this series, we're going to walk through our scriptures <clears throat> and stop to investigate what's being said at critical points in the story. We're going to begin in Genesis, images of God's initial intentions for creation and human life. Then we'll go to Isaiah, prophetic images of restoration and renewal, new life out of death and a return from exile. Then we'll go to the New Testament gospels and letters, good news about the kingdom of God and his ultimate purposes, which have broken now into this very present age. And finally, Revelation, no surprise there. Allusions to and affirmations of the biblical emphases on new life, restoration, the presence of God with humanity, the shalom, justice, and righteousness of God on a restored earth as it always has been in heaven. At the outset of this, the Bible Project has again delivered. I mean, these guys are so good. In wonderful fashion, they've delivered, creating a video to help form our thinking. It's about six minutes long, which is a lengthy video for us, but it's well worth our time. And really, in short order, it's giving you an overview of the series. I am giving away everything I'm about to say for the next five weeks, right? Or that we are going to say as Pastor Mark helps us. So let's go ahead and bring our attention to the screen. In the Bible, the ideas of heaven and earth are ways of talking about God's space and our space. So I understand our space really well. We live here, there's trees, rivers, mountains, but my understanding of God's space gets a little fuzzy. And what we do get in the Bible are images trying to help us grasp God's space, which is basically inconceivable to us. So these are two very different types of spaces. Yes, they're, they're different in their nature, but here's what's really interesting is that in the Bible, these are not always separate spaces. So think of heaven and earth as like different dimensions that can overlap in the same exact space. So we talk a lot about going to heaven after we die, but this idea of heaven and earth overlapping, we don't talk a lot about that. Which is kind of crazy because the union of heaven and earth is what the story of the Bible is all about. How they were once fully united and then driven apart and about how God is bringing them back together once again. So let's go back to the beginning where heaven and earth, they're completely overlapping. Yeah, this is what uh, the Bible's description of the Garden of Eden is all about. It's a place where God and humanity dwelt together perfectly, no separation, and, and humans then partner with God in building a flourishing, beautiful world and so on. But as humans, we wanted to do things a different way. We wanted God out and we wanted to create a world apart from him. Yeah, so we have these two spaces now. And the Bible actually uses lots of different kinds of words and phrases to refer to these two spaces to make a, a clear distinction. So you've said that these spaces can overlap though. So explain how that works. Yeah, this is where we have to start talking about temples. Because in the biblical world, you experience God's presence by going to a temple. That's where heaven and earth uh, overlap. 
Now, there are two types of temples described in the Bible. One is a tabernacle, basically a tent that was built by Moses. And the other was this massive building made by Solomon. And these temples were decorated with fruit trees and flowers and images of angels and all kinds of gold and jewels and so on. And these are designed to make you feel like you're going back to the garden. And at the center of the temple was a place called the Holy of Holies, which was like the hot spot of God's presence. Now we can go and be with God again. But not so fast because the temple also creates a problem. So God's space is full of his presence and goodness and justice and beauty. But human space is full of sin and injustice and the ugliness that results. So how do these spaces overlap if they're so different and they're in conflict with each other? This was resolved through animal sacrifice. Yeah, that's kind of weird. What do animal sacrifices have to do with this? Yeah, the, the idea is this. Animal sacrifices, somehow they absorb the sin when the animal dies in your place. And it creates a clean space, so to speak, where you are now free to enter into the temple and be in God's presence. Okay, so if I'm an Israelite and I live in Jerusalem, I might be able to be in God's presence. But you said the story of the Bible is all of heaven and earth reuniting. Right. So we have to keep going in the story where we come to Jesus in the New Testament. And in the Gospel of John, we hear this claim that God became human in Jesus and made his dwelling among us. Now, this word dwelling is really curious. It, literally, it means he set up a tabernacle among us. And so what John is claiming right here is that Jesus is a temple. He is now the place where heaven and earth overlap. What's interesting about Jesus is that he isn't staying in this safe, clean space. He's running around, hanging out with sinners. He's healing people of their sicknesses and forgiving people of their sins. He's basically creating little pockets of heaven where people can be in God's presence, but he's doing it out there in the middle of the world of sin and death. And he keeps telling everyone that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he even told his followers to pray regularly that God's kingdom come and that his will be done here on earth just as it is in heaven. But a lot of people are threatened by Jesus and they kill him, which seems to spoil this whole plan to reunite heaven and earth. But we, we have to go back to a scene earlier on in Jesus' story where John the Baptist saw Jesus and said, Behold, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus isn't just talked about as being a temple. He's also talked about as being the temple sacrifice. Yeah, so, so the cross is now the place where Jesus absorbs sin to create a clean space that is not limited like animal sacrifices. Jesus' sacrifice has the power to keep spreading and spreading and reuniting more and more of heaven and earth. And this is all really great, but it leaves one big question in my mind, which is what happens when I die? Don't I just fly over to God's space to be with Jesus. Yeah, so a few times in the New Testament, we learn that Christians will be with Jesus in heaven after they die, but that is not the focus of the Bible's story. The focus is on how heaven and earth are being reunited through Jesus and will be completely brought together one day when he returns. So in the book of Revelation, we get this beautiful image of the Garden of Eden, now in the form of a city, coming to end the age of sin and death by redeeming all of human history in a renewed creation. And God's space and human space completely overlap once again. So good. And I don't think I've ever said this after a Bible Project video, but forgive the French, right? Forgive the, uh, yeah. But we get it. Kind of what we've done. Okay. So I asked you to turn to... Genesis 28, and we'll get there shortly, but we want to begin in Genesis with the very first phrase, the first phrase of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. And the first sentence of the Bible, heaven. But notice it's plural, heavens. What is being referenced? Something quite different than what we reference when we speak of a loved one who's in heaven. They were referencing quite literally the sky. Or they might say skies. The heavens for them was a reference for where the birds go, where they cannot go. 
an ancient Israelite's cosmic geography was very different than our own. And it was always plural, always, heavens. It's interesting to stop and think about it always being plural. Uh, this is a bit difficult for us to understand, but the Bible Project has an accompanying podcast around the subject matter. And they had a really fun stretch where they talked about English words that are always plural. There's a few English words that are always plural. Twelve, I believe they said to be exact. You want to know a few of them? Trousers. Scissors. Glasses. Clothes. Nobody says I'm going to go put a cloth on, right? Clothes. Uh, this, this one was my favorite. Shenanigans. <laughs> Never plural. Quit your shenanigan. It's always shenanigans, right? Heavens. Jewish people embrace this notion that God lives in whatever is beyond the sky. There's the sky and then there's what's beyond. Heavens. That God's throne is above it all. He lives in all of his vastness in what is, whatever is beyond. So for instance, we read poetry in the Hebrew scriptures like that of Psalm 11.4. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth, his eyes examine them. So what is the psalmist meaning? Heaven is up high. It's above everything. It's the place from which there's a vantage point to look upon everything. Obviously, this is imagery, metaphorical imagery of transcendence, that he is beyond. Note Psalm 103, 19. The Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. So when, when the biblical authors wanted to talk about God as the king who rules, they often placed his throne in the heavens. And this can make a little bit of sense to us moderns, can it? I mean, think about the English word exalted. It means you're someone of social importance or have authority over something in terms of rank or preeminence. Exalted heavens. Did the biblical author like, like Moses or David really think that God lived in the sky? Did they really think that? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that we can say definitively one way or the other. But what is safe to say is that they didn't have the basic cosmology we do. So what they did in their understanding of the world is they placed God at the highest place of their understanding. The truth is, is that our present grasp of the cosmos, the created order, is more vast than all ancient understanding of it. And here's what we know, there's no end, right? We know enough to say that we don't know where it ends. There is no presently discoverable end to the cosmos. Its vastness is infinite at our point of understanding. And that's where their ancient understanding of God and ours meets. God had no limit to the ancient Israelites. And our understanding of the created order only affirms this truth. We understand the same thing. We just are looking through different lenses. So if we were able to talk to Moses or David today, I think they'd say something like this. I was right. I knew it. But I had no idea how big this thing was. No idea whatsoever. David would say something like, you know, I had just had no idea when I wrote that little ditty about, you know, that song about God, why do you bother paying attention to us when I'm out under a night sky looking at how vast it is and how small I am? I just, I was right, but I had no idea how wrong I was at the same time, right? It was, it's huge. I had no idea just how, how small we actually are. The biblical author also thought that this transcendent God was accessible and his 
presence overlapped here on earth with, with us. So he's transcendent, he's above, but he's also imminent, immediately with. He's both. And that led to the biblical vision of temples as was referenced in the video. God created the heavens and the earth. Where is God? Both. In the heavens, on the earth. But what the biblical authors want us to embrace with them is the idea that God's personal space on earth is heaven. Where God is, that's heaven. Heaven, according to the biblical writers, is less a destination or location and more about God himself. God is about personal presence and heaven is God's personal presence. Thus what we see in Genesis in the very beginning of the story is that heaven and earth are one and the same. God's image bearers live with God in a garden, a temple of sorts, until they don't through the disruption and corruption of rebellion and sin. So let's go ahead and get to, to Genesis 28, which is generations into the human story as is recorded in the Bible, meaning, I mean, we are well on into the human story plagued by a distance, if you will, between, between heaven and earth. Quick context to what we're going to read about here. Let's situate what we're going to read. In Genesis chapter 12, we meet the man God chose to make covenant with and build a people through, a man named Abram who becomes Abraham. Abraham and Sarah have a son named Isaac who had two sons, Jacob and Esau. It was through Jacob that God continued his covenantal commitment. Now this Jacob is a very complex figure. He's deceptive and manipulative, resulting in him seeking and successfully stealing his brother's blessing from, from the father, from Isaac. If you've read the Genesis account, you know that Esau, his brother, did not take to this well. And he plotted to kill his brother upon his father's death. So Jacob goes on the run. And the text tells us that he runs from Beersheba to Haran, which begs that I show you a map. <laughs> you knew it was coming. You can call it out now, huh? Okay, I, I love that. I have trained you well. So Beersheba is all the way down here. So look to the Dead Sea, near the bottom of the Dead Sea, the southern portion of the Dead Sea and go left, Beersheba, all the way down here. So this is where Isaac and Rebecca and the family have settled. He is going to travel all the way up to Haran. Haran, and we'll explain more here in a little bit. What I want you to see is the story of Genesis 28 takes place right here while he is on the journey in Bethel or Bethel, okay? Genesis 28, we're going to be reading verses 10 through 19. Let's begin in verses 10 through 12. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Haran was the spot Jacob's great-grandfather had taken the family to settle. In other words, Abraham's dad. That's where they had settled. So therefore, Jacob's extended family still lived there. And now that he's fleeing from his brother, he's being sent to extended family Having traveled a portion of the way, he stops to rest. And suddenly, heaven arrives on earth. The text describes a stairway, which is the Hebrew word sulam, 
which sometimes is translated as ladder. If you've heard of Jacob's ladder, this is the text it's referencing, but ladder really doesn't serve us well. That's not really what the text is representing. Think of it as something of a ramp or rather a prolonged staircase that was common in the ancient world that Jacob lived in, the Mesopotamian world that he lived in for a, a, a religious house or a temple. It was called a ziggurat. And in fact, I have a photo here of a, a ziggurat that continues to stand in Iraq today. So when, when we're hearing about Jacob's stairway, I want you to think of a wide staircase akin to this one, that he's seeing the staircase. And it's the staircase of a temple or heaven on earth. He sees these angelic creatures traveling between the two. And then let's continue in verse 13. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north, to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Can we just stop and observe? Jacob's fleeing because he's been treacherous. <laughs> Jacob's in trouble, and it's his own fault. And notice how good God is to him. Have you ever made a mess of your life? Jacob had to. Just notice God's character here. It's not the point of the teaching series. It's not the point I'm gonna linger on, but just notice the character of God. Jacob was a wretch at this point in his story, and God was committed to him nonetheless. As Jacob sees this staircase, he also then sees the Lord who further speaks to him. And it's the restatement of the promise first made to his grandfather Abraham and then to his father Isaac. And the promise is threefold. I will give you this land, your descendants will be many, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. It's the exact same promise given to Abraham and then re-ratified to Isaac. And while Jacob had heard these promises from those who had gone before him, he now heard them directly from God in personal encounter. God furthermore promised to be with Jacob on this journey as he flees for his life. I am with you. In the midst of this very insecure moment in Jacob's life, God offered his personal presence as that which Jacob needed. And isn't that just like the God we serve? Let's continue in verse 16. When Jacob awoke from sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, Bethel. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Bethel lose. So this experience has taken Jacob quite by surprise. I mean, the text makes it plain. He is surprised. <laughs> and clearly this is more than just a radical dream. Jacob was not seeking God's presence. Jacob was running for his life. Jacob was lonely and fearful and just trying to make something of his life before it's over. Jacob was not seeking God's presence. He'd heard about God, but Jacob had not had the personal encounter his father and grandfather had had. Jacob was not seeking God's presence, but God was seeking Jacob in a moment of sheer grace. When you are running for your life, I am with you. This vision leaves Jacob awed and convinced that this specific location 
is Bethel, the house of God. The very entrance to heaven, if you will, to, to Jacob. As God promised Jacob this land, he would have understood then that God was promising to give him the land that included this gate of heaven. A genuine honor and fear of the Lord begins to settle on Jacob's life that had not been present before. What we see is that something from this encounter begins to change Jacob. Not completely, but it's a, it's a starting point. And while he'd heard of the Lord, he was, he was unfamiliar with his ways. And here, Jacob begins his response to God. If we were to continue to read the text, what we would, we would learn is that Jacob moves into worship. He begins to worship the Lord at this point. And I, I think as we talk about heaven, I think it's just worth stopping to notice that whenever we encounter the presence of God and whenever we're in an atmosphere akin to heaven, what is the most appropriate biblical response time and time and time and time again? Worship. And remember that worship is not us finding God. It's our response to the God who has found us. Worship is always a response. Jacob wasn't looking for God, but God found him and Jacob worshiped. This spot, interestingly enough, was so significant in Jacob's life that this is the spot where Jacob chooses to settle with his children at God's direction. The house of God becomes Jacob's house. We don't have time to study today the, the next mo moment where Jacob encountered God in a profound way. That's recorded in Genesis 32. There's this whole stretch in the book of Genesis between 28 and 32 where Jacob is learning the ways of the Lord. And it's through two divine encounters. Genesis 32, of course, is the story where again, 20 years later, Jacob's running for his life. And he has his sister wives and his many children in tow with him. And I'm not trying to be salacious when I say sister wives. They were literally sisters and they were both his wives, right? So he's running for his life, this time from his father-in-law. <laughs> and so in fear, Jacob sends a portion of the delegation away from him and then he moves away from the other part. He's alone. Jacob's alone again. 20 years later, Jacob's alone. And at night, a man shows up that he wrestles with. And the text tells us that he wrestles with him all night long. And, and do you know that this is the night that he's renamed Israel? Jacob is renamed Israel. Do you know what Israel means? Essentially to wrestle with God. Jacob names that place face of God because in his words, he saw the face of God and he didn't die. <laughs> Jacob encountered heaven. This is essentially what he's saying. I saw heaven, if you will. I saw God in his presence and I am alive to tell about it. Hmm. Let's make two conclusions today for application as we commence our, our series on heaven. Heaven and earth, and the first one we want to make is this, that God longs to bring heaven to earth. Honestly, guys, it's the exact opposite of what we usually think, that we want, oh, I wanna go to heaven. What God would say, what God's heart says is, well, I want to bring heaven to earth. As we begin our study, we want to note that according to original design and God's intentionality, heaven and earth were not separate spaces, dimensions, if you will. There had not yet been a divorce. And if this is an appropriate metaphor, let's again make clear that we are the ones who sought the separation. God created with specific intention of living with his creation in fullness, in fullness. The distance that can often 
translate to us as cruel was never within the purpose of God for us. Sometimes in life when we struggle, when there's profound suffering, when we feel as though we are knocking on heaven's door in prayer and all we get is a shut door. Sometimes the distance, if you will, feels quite profound and can feel cruel. But we must know that that was never God's intention. And it was never in his design. Death wasn't in the purpose of God for us. Death in any form and manifestation of it. Shame, blame, misunderstanding, death was never a purpose of God. Death is a distortion, a parasitic reality holding on to us until the day it is fully overthrown and it will be overthrown. So Easter proclaims to us, death will be overthrown and it has already been started. We now await the fullness of it. So for many of us, heaven is the place we go when we die, or better said, heaven's the place our loved ones go when they die. That is our expectation. Good and right, good. That theology isn't wrong. But again, if we're really going to just listen to our scriptures, listen to the priorities of the way in which heaven is discussed, within our scriptures, then we're actually going to realize that, you know, heaven, the place we go when we die, is not, it's not quite the priority that it is for many of us in our conversations. What we see in the very beginning, in Genesis, is God's desire to repair. Here's what Genesis tells us. God has desired to repair the damage and the distance, to begin the process of remarrying heaven and earth. And as our study continues, we hope to reframe this, inform this all that much more as God unveils his purposes over time in history. So heaven and earth, God longs to bring heaven to earth. Maybe you've, maybe you've reflected on this as we sing some of our worship songs, right? There's one particular song that we sing about God bringing, you didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. And you're like, Oh, that's cute. What a pleasant thought. I've thought, can I just be honest? I've thought that. Oh, you didn't want heaven without me. Oh, that's so wonderful. So you've brought it to me. Well, guys, that's what the scriptures teach. I mean, there's a reshaping of my own thinking in this. This is what the scriptures teach. It's not a nice thought. It's gospel truth. Heaven and earth. God longs to bring heaven to earth. Number two, from the earliest descriptions of it, heaven is always about divine presence. I think my favorite part of Genesis 28 and the story about Jacob is that Jesus used that story to communicate something about himself. We learn about it in John chapter 1. And it's the occasion where Jesus interacts with Nathaniel, who becomes one of his disciples. The scene specifically describes the first moment of encounter with, between Nathaniel and Jesus, similar to Jacob's first encounter with the Lord. When Jesus sees Nathaniel, Jesus commends him as someone who is true who lives without duplicity. Ah, here, Jesus says, is a true Israelite. Jesus honors Nathanael's integrity, that he is who he is, wherever he is, with whomever he is. And in response, Nathanael says, how do you know the first thing about me? We've never seen each other. How do you know me? And Jesus essentially says, well, 
I know things about you even without encountering you. Well, I saw you, here's what Jesus says, I saw you under the fig tree. And while that pr- could be a literal, like, hey, I was walking, you know, walk, walking down the highway and I looked over in one of many fig trees and I, I saw a guy and I knew his name was Nathaniel, even though I never, I mean, it could be a reference to that, but it is in all likelihood something of a word of knowledge as we would understand it from the New Testament, prophetic insight. And in the midst of this encounter, Nathaniel's like, you are the Messiah of Israel. I mean, Nathaniel's deeply moved and he, he speaks identity. Oh, this is what people are saying about, I, I agree with it. Remarkable faith from Nathaniel. Listen to Jesus's observation. And then this moment where he references Genesis 28, John 1, 50 and 51. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now that's a pleasant passage without Genesis 28 as the backstory. But with Genesis 28, Do you see what Jesus is saying? (laughs) Do you see what he's saying? Where God revealed himself to Jacob at Bethel, house of God, he was now doing so fully, finally, in finality through his son. Jesus is the decisive ultimate connection between heaven and earth. Jesus is Jacob's staircase. (laughs) You know that that thing, Nathaniel, you learned about in all your growing up years? You know the thing that sometimes we read in synagogue? You know Bethel, where this happened. You know all of that? You're going to see heaven on earth. I'm bringing it. In a sense, Jesus was saying, I am it. I am. So as we begin to reframe our thoughts around heaven, maybe we would just conclude with this. Heaven is far less about a destination and far more about a relationship. Heaven. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word that leads us into all truth. Lord, we wanna think what you're thinking and we wanna live the way your son has taught us to live. So would you use this teaching, which honestly, Lord, is just, it's a flying over at 10,000 feet. But Lord, would you use some of the truths in it just to shape us today? And I think even for me, Lord, my own response is, God, would you keep doing a work inside of me, inside of us, where I want you more than anything else? The psalmist once wrote that there is nothing in heaven nor on earth that I desire more than you. And we join the psalmist in praying that today. That Lord, we were made by you and we were made for you. And if heaven is you, if heaven is about being with you, (laughs) and we know this, Lord, that we can be with you right here and right now. And so, Lord, would you lavish your presence upon us? Holy Spirit who lives in us, would you let the truth of Jesus shape us more and more? Lord, would you give us encounter? Uh, What we read today between Jacob and Nathaniel, what we read today was about encounter. And Lord, we want ongoing life-giving encounter with you. And in the process, would you shape the kingdom of heaven in us? That we just keep asking you for this. Would you shape the kingdom of heaven in us? More of you, more of your life, more of your ways and less of our broken patterns, less of our own dead end thinking, 
Lord, less escapism to another realm and more let's bring heaven with Jesus to wherever we go. More of being on mission with you, Jesus. We love you. And we ask all of this in your wonderful name. And would you say with me? Amen.